12 years ago, I was, my spinal cord was injured in a surfing accident in Mexico, and I ignored it, just kept living my life, and then I had a couple accidents that caused some concussions along the way, ignored all that, just kept living my life, and then 2014, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and, the, and the, the neurologist said, you have Parkinson's disease, and here's your prescriptions. And I said, I don't have Parkinson's disease. You can't tell me I have Parkinson's disease. You can tell me I have symptoms, but you can't tell me what I have. So I, I threw the prescriptions in the garbage and, threw, and uh, never looked back, bought some books, read half of one book, threw the other three books away, and said, this is not my story. And I continued on my path of living my life. And then I was taking a Feldenkrais movement class who happened to be from, the teacher was a retired neurologist. And she said, Nancy, I don't know if you have Parkinson's disease or not, but you have a spinal cord injury and you better take care of it right away because it doesn't get any better, it gets worse. So here's the name of a neurosurgeon and I would suggest you go immediately to see him. And this was in 2017. So I listened to the doctor and said, okay, and he said, we need to do surgery right away. It's very critical. And of course, I didn't even realize I had, a, had severe disease of the, of the neck, but he told me I did. And uh, Were you having any symptoms, Nancy? What? I mean, what caused them to tell you that you had, first of all, Parkinson's disease? Were you having symptoms? I was having symptoms, yes. What were the symptoms? Um, slow, slowness of movement, loss of smell, um, what are some of um, Not moving my left arm as I was walking. Um, small handwriting. So basically, the, and then I didn't believe that doctor, so I went to the second neurologist back then, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, you have the same thing. And she says, here's your medicine. I said, I don't want that medicine. She said, well, promise me that when, you're, when you go to the freeze mode in about four years from now, that you would uh, t tell your, listen to your children and your husband, and you'll take it because you should be taking it now. And I said, it's not my world, I'm not doing that, leave me alone, I'm out the door. <clears throat> so, 2017, the, I, the uh, retired neurologist that's teaching this class tells me to go to the doctor, so I go. And within two weeks, I, was, I had a laminectomy, which is C3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, opening up my, sp my cervical uh, spine. And he said, I'd walk the first night, and I'd be out in three or four days. And I woke up, a quadriplegic. Whoops. Whoops is right. So what they do is they go in and the back parts of the vertebrae are called lamina. So they cut the vertebrae on both sides. You know the bumps down your spine? Well, there's two just wings that come together and they form that bump. So they cut the both sides off. And in her case, from C3 all the way down. Seven. To seven, so she, they took off the back parts of the vertebrae in an attempt to create more space for the spinal cord. But a lot of times when they do that, they displace tissue or make the spinal dura, the, the wrapping around the spinal cord more tense or more tight. And then what it does is it's literally that dura, the, 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 uh, the layer around the cord gets pulled up, and it just shuts conductivity off immediately. I didn't know that. <laughs> I've seen enough of them. Because when I'd asked my neurosurgeon what happened, he wouldn't talk to me. He stopped talking to me. He just said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. So I yeah. never heard that. Yeah. yeah. That's good to know. We used to see this in my clinic quite a bit, women that are people who have had epidurals also. Mm -hmm. Wow. Especially epidural of the neck, a lot of times when they go in there and they pierce that uh, wrapping on the spinal cord, it literally contracts and they have incredible loss of sensation in their feet or just incredible uh, headaches because that, that dura contracts and it just pulls from the skull to the tailbone. And a lot of times when they intervene like this, the dura gets displaced and it just is, shuts everything off. Conductivity just goes quickly. Oh, wow, that's exactly what happened to me. So I woke up trapped in my body. I, could, I can see and I can talk. Um, my brain worked, but that's about all that worked. So obviously life started, changed drastically in that moment. And it took me a while to, to come to grips with it. And 
I was heavily sedated with fentanyl and Dilata and Valium and all this stuff, so I never could feel my body. I couldn't feel anything because I was so heavily sedated. And uh, about six days or seven days when I was able to focus what, and understand what was happening to me, my daughter, I didn't know if I wanted to live at that point. Thank you. So my daughter, who uh, is 31 years old, had just had our first grandchild, and he was two months old. And uh, she sat on my bed at the, and I was just barely remembering this, but she sat on the end of my bed in the hospital with this baby, and she's sobbing, and she's saying, Mom, you gotta live. Mom, you gotta live. I need a mother. I need a grandson that has a grandmother. You gotta live. Pull, your, pull yourself out of this. Everything you taught me, Mom, you need to turn on yourself. You can do it, you can do it. You gotta, you gotta live. <laughs> this is Tino, he's two months old. <laughs> and so the next day I told the nurses and the doctors, I said, pull all this crap off of me, get this fentanyl patch off of me, I'm gonna live. <laughs> so the opportunity to open my heart began right at that moment because I couldn't open my heart. She busted, the op she busted it wide open for me with a jackhammer and all of a sudden I had a reason to pull out of this. And this was, little boy was my reason and we would look at each other and our eyes would lock and he was two months old and we had, we'd have conversations telepathically and he would tell me, Gigi, we're going to do this together. We're going to do this together. We're going to learn to walk together. We're going to learn to crawl together. We are going to learn how to feed ourselves, each of us, as his little hand and my little hand, trying to reach my mouth and his trying to reach his mouth. And so he was my total inspiration to begin to do what the work that I had to begin to do. So what happened after that was my dear friend told me about Joe Dispenza, and I went, oh yeah, I remember hearing something about that a long time ago. And so I downloaded Supernatural, I downloaded the Audible, and I was so excited about what I was learning, I, re I replayed it, replayed it, replayed it, replayed it, replayed it. I just arbitrarily picked different places along the book, and then I, then I downloaded Breaking the Habit of Seeing your, Being Yourself, then I downloaded Placebo Effect, and so I listened 24-7, to his videos, to his audios, 24-7. Oh, so I would listen thing. to it, and I would plug, plug my, phone, my earphones in and lay in bed all night long. I would listen and listen. I'd wake up, and he'd be in my head. I'd wake up, and he'd be in my head. My husband would say, what are you doing? And I said, listen to Joe. And he'd say, he'd say you should listen to me sometime. So, Wait a second. There's too many juicy things in there. <laughs> so by listening to the knowledge and the information, it, she wanted to know the information so well that she wouldn't forget it. At, so if you keep firing and wiring, keep paying attention, you keep repeating, you keep reviewing, Learning turns into memory. Now she's got a big philosophical, neurological network to assign more meaning to what she's doing. That's what I'm pressing my team leaders to do. I want them to be, I want them to be versed, versed in any question, in any direction, because the sum of the parts is greater than the whole, and this is how you get there. And to the point where you could actually anticipate what I'm going to say or anticipate, you understand it then to that level, to that depth. That will be the voice in your head when it's time to apply this. Not the voice I can't. The voice like, I understand what I'm doing here. I'm not 20% in. I'm not 50%. I'm all in. So by learning all of this, she's, she built a sound <coughs> neurological network to then install the hardware in preparation for the experience. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So. Exactly. I, w I watched all of his videos, all of his YouTube, over and over again. I watched all of his interviews over and over again. 
all at the same time I'm listening to all the audibles. And I began to listen and listen and would, and before, before I came to this workshop. And then in, just in January, so just October, this is how life changed. I was still in a wheelchair in October. As of February of this year, I had full, still had full-time care, 24-7 care. As of February of this year, I let my, my uh, nurse, nurse practitioner or my CNA go in February. So, this, so my, my exponential healing began when I started practicing the work that Dr. Joe has laid out. And so I, let, I set my intentions. Of, of course, my intention was to be a grandmother. I set my intention that I'm going to go camping with my grandson. I'm going to build sand castles in the sand with my... Sounds like a mind movie to me. <laughs> I built a studio in my second bedroom in my home that was my healing studio. I had affirmations. And instead of the mind movie at the time, I didn't know what that was. My daughter built a 10-foot vision board. This is mom's affirmation wall that we put up today. So I'd focus on the vision of the future. And so I was constantly in looking at my intention and my future and totally removed the emotions of the past. And so I slowly began to visualize and feel the emotions of running, feel the emotions of hiking. And by, February, by January, I had signed up for his progressive, and I knew I was going to come to the workshop in, in Portland um, and wrote that in my book so that I knew I'd manifest that. So it was very clear that I needed to keep my focus and my intention. I also was very clear that I needed to begin to heal um, my heart. And so she broke open the heart, but I just learned probably about a month ago, if, if that long ago, she, my daughter was talking to a friend of hers, and she said, you know, I've never seen... I only saw my mother cry two times in my childhood. And one time was when my dad died. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I had no idea that I didn't, my heart, my centers were so closed down all these years that there was no movement even in my own heart. And so I said, I'm so sorry, honey. She said, don't worry about it, mom. I worked it out in counseling. I said, okay, good. So I knew that the vibrations around me were, were critical and the voices around me were critical. So I was very careful not to talk about my story, especially because I didn't want people to go, oh, I'm so sorry, you have Parkinson's. Oh, I'm so sorry. And then, they, then, then mentally they go right into this stuff I was reading in the book a long time ago. And I'm like, that's the collective consciousness. That's not my consciousness. And so, when people do that, they get attention. And where you place your attention is where you place your... And now there's a bond that's based in need, right? It's not a good energetic bond, but it's based in need. Sorry. And so she stayed away from that. And by making different choices like that, it's going to feel a little unfamiliar, a little uncomfortable. But she knows that she's doing it and she's leaving the known. So that's a good fertile place for her to create from. And as long as she's doing the work and she stops doing all those things, she'll stay in the unknown and she's going to walk into that future. So I was very clear on my intention of only putting positive energy around me. So whatever, I would not think negative thoughts. If anyone around me said anything negative, I would, I would ask them you know, to, to either rephrase it or I would just, in my mind, hit cancel. I had a, a physical therapist say, you know, raise your weak arm. And I said, this arm's not weak. This is my arm. This is, this, is who I, this is who I am with my arm. She belongs to me. Don't call her weak. So I was always changing my dialogue in my head and those around me. I had to ask my husband to start wearing earphones when he watched TV because I didn't want any kind of negative programming coming into my home. He was very accommodating. Pretty soon I asked him just to turn off the TV and he went upstairs and watched it. So I never saw it because even though the, the sound wasn't on, I felt the vibration of the video was coming through my space. So I removed all negative talk, negative talk, self-talk, people around me. I set boundaries. I wouldn't answer the phone. That was a big one. So people that were toxic to me are no longer in my life. And that's been a very difficult struggle because there's some people very close in my, in my sphere of family. Um, so I was very clear in, in my intention of no negative talk. I was also very clear, in fact, I had a, one of my caretakers tell my doctor, one of my doctors, oh, she'll never get better. And he called me up, he's a spinologist, uh, chiropractor. He called me up, he said, Dance, you need to get rid of that caretaker. And the next day I fired her. 
So I had the same thing happen with an occupational therapist. Said, oh, this hand will never get better. And I went, oh my gosh, I can't have you in my life. You're gone. So, any, so anyone that did not believe in my dream and my vision could not be part of my life. How many people understand this? <clears throat> now, number one, number one, her commitment and her purpose to be healed is greater than her commitment or purpose to be liked. And she has to put herself first because if she compromises, she gives a piece of herself and you keep doing that before you know it, you don't know who you are any longer. Yeah? yeah. So she, she does that with the understanding that she's going to make very selective choices for herself. Yes or no? Do you think that by doing this and doing it well, that she can still love those people? She could still appreciate those people, but there'll come a point in her future when she's at a point where there'll be no longer any tug any longer because she's overcome those final emotions that keep us connected to those people. You understand? So, <clears throat> go ahead. Well, I'll save it. going back to October when I got introduced to Dr. Joe's material formally, I, that's about a couple of weeks after I drew the line in the sand and I was looking out the window because I was still in a wheelchair and I said, I can't live this way. I, I can't even walk 10 feet to the mailbox to get mail. I can't walk my dog. And I, I'm going to make changes, and this, is, this was a life-defining moment, and that was just October. So that's how all this began, was at that moment in time which you talked about through your lectures here, when you just said, there is no, it's either this or this, there is, there is no, there's no failure. That's how I felt. I was all, all in. I just said, all in, whatever that looks like, I'll go wherever I have to go. I'll spend money wherever I have to spend the money, but I'm all in to change my life. So I'd watch everything I could on Netflix that was inspirational. It gave me hope. It gave me love. It gave me life. and gave me a, a, a blueprint. I also talk about blueprint. I actually would do a blueprint on my body, and I would move in psychically into that blueprint. So if I had to do anything difficult, like when I was leaving the hospital, uh, they were, I worked for three days on my blueprint on how to get out of a wheelchair and into a car. It took me three days of my blueprint Thinking through, thinking it, and working through it. Sounds so. like mental rehearsal to me. <laughs> Excellent. I laid there in bed, not able to do much, and just redesigned my life. So I looked at it like life by design and not by default. I wasn't going to default anymore in my life. And when I was able to get up and walk a little bit, and my caretaker would take me to the YMCA, and I'd get on that treadmill, and I would shut my eyes and have have the supernatural in my ears and I was holding on holding on to that treadmill with my eyes shut and I was walking up the mountain behind my home with my grandson and I'd hang on and I could feel I could feel I could feel the air I could smell the air I felt the dirt coming up from the from the trail I could smell the sagebrush I felt I was actually there and I was walking with all my all my life force and so I'm walking and walking and walking. I'm holding on with my eyes are shut. And all of a sudden, I just out of nowhere had this explosion on the treadmill. <laughs> and I just went, yes, yes, yes. And of course, the people around me went. <laughs> but I had, that, I had that feeling. I nice. had that feeling of just overwhelmed joy of life. The whole body changed in that explosion. And then so things began exponentially improving, improving, and one success at a time, whether it was feeding myself or holding my own toothbrush. Or I, t I took every victory or every success and built upon it and resonated with it and it had so much gratitude. I have so much gratitude for my body that every day I st start my day thanking my body for being here with me. Just in the last three weeks, I was able to actually get off the floor, go on do a yoga pose on the floor and get up from the floor. Up to that point, I couldn't even get on the floor and get up. Now I'm getting on the floor multiple times a day at this workshop. So it's like my supernatural body is super, doing supernatural things for me. Just three weeks ago, I went camping with my daughter and son-in-law and my two-year-old grandson. Yay! This is a dream come true. I focused, my, laid my intention, felt the vibes, put out the frequency, 
This is what got me walking. This is what got me out of bed. This is what got me out of the wheelchair. And I think what's important, because so many people want to get into these workshops and they can't get in, because either it's too expensive or the wait list is, you know, a mile long, and the, and you don't have to come to the workshop. The books, the books and the tapes. I listened to all of his uh, YouTube channel many times. All of his interviews. Um, I was living it. Nancy, what you have is um, an alignment of your will with, uh, combined with an awareness of a sense of purpose, and then you use the um, your your capacity for focus uh, and your willpower, uh, which is really it really is power. That's the only thing that really gives us like the capacity to do work. It's not intellectual thoughts. It's more like knowing here, and you've known here, and you've worked from your heart um, throughout this whole process to, and that's why I think it's, it seems, um, to some people it seems miraculous, but um, I have seen this enough to know that this is actually just a natural state of affairs, um, and uh, it's just not something that uh, many people um, work to achieve. The most exciting thing ever is to come to this, come to this workshop and hear him talk and like, I did that. I did that. So I had no conscious effort of thinking I did that as a result of the book until I'm here, I'm listening to all the things you're talking about. I went, well, that makes sense. I did that too. Aww. So Yay. thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Basically, I can, I can walk now, I can run. Um, I'm living a full life. I can drive my car. On your mark, get set, go! Yay! Woo! And basically I feel not just a, a better version of myself, but, but a whole reincarnation of myself.